It's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Sol Price School of Public Policy, as well as my dear friend and colleague, Marlon Bournet, who happens to be the director and uh, of our Executive Master in Urban Planning Program and the chair of the planning department. So this is in a series of uh, talks uh, that for professional development, this happens to be the fifth of uh, eight. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have some of my colleagues wearing my other hat of, of a council member that are with us uh, today uh, in order to explore uh, the possibility for running for office or public service. With that, I'm gonna turn the conversation over to our moderator, Valerie Sevier, who happens to be the director of our professional development program here at the USC Price, which of course uh, happens to be a professional school, even though we train scholars, but a predominant uh, number of our students uh, are interested in the profession and hopefully we can convince today public service. Valerie. Thank you so much, uh, Frank, for that generous introduction. Um, I wanna join Frank in welcoming everyone to the fifth uh, panel and um, thank this storied group of panelists for joining us this evening. Um, I recognize many of our students and for those of you that I don't know, don't know me, I'm Valerie Savior. Um, our office is here to support your career trajectory. Um, we have numerous events and activities that you can participate in. This has been a lovely partnership um, with uh, the Office of Spatial Analysis and Urban Planning. I wanna thank uh, Terrence uh, Rucker, who has worked very hard to put these events together. He's off camera right now working in the background. Um, if you haven't joined us before, uh, we generally are pretty tight on our one hour commitment to our professionals and to you. We'll spend about the 30, first 30 minutes in a Q&A so we learn the background of these professionals and then it's your time. Uh, please feel free to either chat questions privately to Terrence or myself at any point. We'll queue up the questions and we'll make every effort to address all of them. Or please feel free to unmute yourself and get on camera and just ask your question directly to our panelists. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start with our own, our Professor Frank Zerunian. And um, the first question panelists is, you know, you have about three minutes or four minutes at most. Give us a little bit of your own career journey uh, or themes of your personal career journey into a decision to be an elected official and a lead a public life. And perhaps maybe a couple tips that you might, uh, or hints about what you would offer students who are seeking in a career field. Thank you, Frank. Th thank you, Valerie. And, and thank you again for doing this. This is extremely valuable for our students and I know so because they come to me on a regular basis. They spend a lot of time in my office discussing this particular topic. But my journey actually to a public office comes through law. Um, I'm a lawyer by training, as, as you know. Yes. Um, and um, I uh, was trained in uh, uh, particularly in the land use, uh, real estate, real estate finance uh, field. I've represented developers, governments, banks in my law practice before coming to academia 12 years ago to USC. Um, uh, teaching has been in my family for a long time. Uh, my great uncle, unfortunately, one who uh, uh, was uh, uh, slaughtered during the first genocide uh, of the 20th century as part of the Armenian genocide, was actually a Roberts College graduate who uh, uh, was kind of the Ottoman Empire's Harvard of the East, if you will, uh, and taught. Uh, my aunt taught. Uh, so I come from a line of teachers, uh, and I've always liked teaching, so that's why I'm here uh, kind of uh, switching careers, if you will, uh, at USC coming uh, from the practice of law. Um, but my journey in, in public office, which I hope that most will embrace, uh, comes also from the family, as my great-grandfather uh, was a school board member, um, and public service was always instilled in me from childhood on. Um, and then when the opportunity came uh, in my own city to be appointed to the uh, planning commission, at the time the mayor was also a lawyer, asked me whether or not I would serve on our local planning commission, and of course I've accepted that. Um, 
And uh, that's really a good way to get to learn your own city, your land use, and uh, the culture of your city, because most local governments, the most important function that they have, of course, is their own land use and, and how they govern their own city with respect to their land use. So that it was very helpful. And then when our mayor was retiring, um, she asked whether or not I would run for her um, uh, seat. And I did, that was in 2003 and uh, still here. So uh, that's kind of my, uh, my quick uh, rundown on, on the journey to uh, being a council member. We rotate our mayorship. So I've been mayor three times um, in these 17 years that I've served. Um, and uh, I also was elected president of California Contract Cities, which is the second largest municipal organization in the state. Um, with about 80 cities, about 7 million residents or so, um, for which I advocated both in Sacramento and, and mostly in Sacramento because contracting law is more state law than it is federal law. Um, and that's really how uh, I came to uh, public service, but it has been a wonderful experience. Um, I serve completely voluntarily. We don't get paid in our city for what we do. and. Uh, I've always said to my students, I've gained more from public service than I have given. So I'm eternally grateful for being able to serve in public office and I hope that others do the same. Frank, thank you. That's just a, a, a wonderful um, introduction and beginning of a, a robust conversation, I'm sure. Um, let's move on to Shirley Rouse, a city council member at Hedwig Village. Welcome. Hi, thanks so much, Valerie. Um, and I'm I'm in Texas. I think the other three panelists are all in California. So maybe there's some students on here that are not from California, but I just wanted to bring that up. And I'll talk first about my sort of professional work because I'm in the same situation as uh, the professor and then I'm a volunteer city official and I have a professional life as well. Um, I'm an independent consultant in the smart utilities business. So I work with retail energy providers electric and gas utilities, and renewable energy programs. I attended Princeton University where I studied engineering and system management, and then I moved into the software business. After several years in business operational roles, I became head of a $1.3 billion divi excuse me, division for a Fortune 200 electricity provider serving one and a half million customers in Houston. Each step of my career, was oriented to being at the front edge of, of change and innovation in business. Um, today, that edge I see is at the application of data analytics and artificial intelligence and smart utilities. Um, some applications of this are consumer products like the Nest thermostat or the Ring doorbell. Uh, both of these provide a front end that's useful for consumers they also both gather a tremendous amount of data in the back end, and that's analyzed and aggregated for other uses. I'm also currently a student in the USC Executive Masters in Urban Planning Program, which was always online even before the pandemic. So I've had a successful professional career and I wanted to give back to the community, so ran for public office. I'm an elected city council member in a small city that's completely surrounded by Houston, Texas, and I previously served on the Planning and Zoning Commission. Hedwig Village has a mayor and five elected city council members and we meet monthly. Some of our recent city decisions have been in the area of planned unit developments and planning out a new stormwater drainage system, which something which is incredibly expensive in a city like Houston um, for, you know, for the size of city that we are. My interest in politics came from an interest in policy and I recently read a new book that's out about former Secretary of State James Baker. One of the things he said was, if you want to have an impact in policy, do something in politics first. And I think that's really good advice because block walking and campaigning will teach you a lot about the world that'll be useful for whatever you decide to do in the future. Thank you. 
Shirley, thank you so much. Um, so exciting to hear because you, uh, Frank has a whole career and an elected life. You have a whole career and elected life and they're quite different, so very exciting. Uh, to Marsha, our mayor of Los Gatos, welcome. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you for having me and to my other panelists. It's great to be here and my, my uh, former professor, Frank Zerunian, because I am a graduate in May of 2020 from the first cohort of the USC Saul Price School uh, Executive Masters of Urban Planning. Very proud to be that graduate. Unfortunately, we didn't get to come to campus and do our graduation, but maybe someday. Uh, currently, I am the mayor of Los Gatos, California. It is in the Greater Bay Area, the South Bay Area, 10 miles southwest of San Jose. We are on, we are in the Silicon Valley, uh, but sit, we are a small town of 30,000 people and sit at the base of the Santa Cruz Mountains. So we, it, feels a little bit like you're not in Silicon Valley, but we are the home of Netflix, so we definitely are. Um, I have a path to public service that's very much like the professors. My family uh, was always public service oriented and we were always instilled with the value that we should be involved with our community and giving back to our community. My father was the elected district attorney of Alameda County, which is Oakland. Um, and so we were always aware of that, but. Um, it's interesting that I'm an elected official because I always swore whenever my father had to run that I would never do that. And yet here I am. Um, I am also a lawyer by training. Uh, I went to Cal and have an, a degree in English uh, and then went and became a lawyer, but I did not work in private practice. I followed through with my public service and became a both a state and federal prosecutor. So I spent my career as a trial lawyer and prosecutor. And by doing that, I do, did develop a lot of skills that are useful in my current career, which is analyzing issues, figuring out policies, speaking, making presentations, which has been very valuable. Um, so I, I came to it as a lawyer and like the professor and like Shirley, I was on a planning commission. And uh, that is definitely a path to uh, the town council where I live. Uh, I was appointed. We do an electoral, we do a application process and you, then you're appointed by the full council. I served on the planning commission for 10 years. I quit because I thought it was some time for somebody else to do that job. Um, I went, I was working as a federal prosecutor then full time and had young children. Uh, and then I quit the active practice of law uh, and went back to the planning commission. And then I was actually asked to run for council, even though I declared I would never do that. I did do it. Uh, and I've been on the council now for eight years and I'm in my second term as mayor. And we may get into this, but um, just to let you all know, it's very interesting being mayor during the middle of a pandemic. How were we gonna run our policies? How would we respond economically? What would we do? And because we're next to the mountains, we also have a wildfire risk and you know, all of you know, uh, and my meeting, I'm sorry, I have to leave five minutes early is an ad hoc fire, wildfire uh, preparedness committee. Uh, so we've, and we are also had protests in our town this summer over Black Lives Matter. So we've started a culture, cultural diversity and inclusiveness workshop, and we're doing our last uh, workshop on that on Thursday night. So we've been very active, even though our public processes have been uh, suspended. So I hope all of you, you know, will find this interesting. It's not something you do for money. I, I get $230 every two weeks. Um, so always good to have a backup career or have a, have a career that you are established in when you go into this, or just know that this is your passion and it's what you want to do, but it's very fulfilling. And I'm glad you're all here to learn something about it. it and it is worthwhile uh, to give back to your community and feel like you've helped to shape something that you can be proud of. So thank you, Valerie. Uh, thank you so much, Marsha. So many great themes that I hope students will pick up on and ask, um, insightful questions to learn more. Um, and of course, our final panelists, um, former LA City Council member, Mike Wu, welcome. Um, please introduce yourself and share a bit about your journey. Thanks, Valerie. Um, uh, I think my main claim to fame is that I was a member of the LA City Council. I was the first Asian American and also the first trained urban planner 
uh, to uh, serve on the city's governing body. Uh, but I think maybe a greater distinction is that I used to teach the undergraduate introduction to urban planning at USC uh, for about seven years. So I, I had a role in helping to educate the next generation of urban planners. But to try to get to the point of how did I, how did I, how did I get into public life, um, I would say in to a large extent, it has to do with when you're born and what are the circumstances and the political issues. The fact that I came of age politically in the 1960s and the 1970s meant that I was really shaped by, like many other college students at that time, the big issues, the war in Vietnam, uh, racial unrest in the cities. And when I think back to those times, I think it really made me an idealist. It made me want to change the world. And eventually, I think that brought me to politics. Um, I, I specifically remember from 1968, when I was 17 years old, uh, the, the assassination of Martin Luther King, and noticing the response of political leadership at that time. Mayor Bradley in New York City being brave enough to go up to uh, Harlem, uh, when people were wondering if Harlan was going to break out in a riot. Uh, Senator Robert Kennedy uh, speaking to a crowd of his supporters in Indianapolis, trying to explain what was going on. And I think that that put some, some, the seed in me of wondering about, could I do something like that in the future? So I uh, went to college south of Los Gatos at UC Santa Cruz, um, eventually decided after four years of going to college in a redwood forest that I was, was really interested in cities and ended up studying city planning at UC Berkeley, where um, I, I uh, was fortunate to have several mentors who crossed the boundaries between politics and urban planning who had a big influence on me. Uh, eventually, I got a job in my 20s as a legislative, a legislative assistant to the majority leader of the state Senate. And so working in Sacramento, working with legislators, lobbyists, reporters, showed me that you do not have to be a superhero. You do not have to have superhuman qualities to be an elected official. Most of the elected officials I saw in Sacramento were actually quite normal, but they were normal. They were normal, but they were being placed in unusual circumstances, which sometimes brought out leadership, sometimes brought out strange behavior, uh, but somehow I was able to learn how the process worked. And so after about four years, I decided to go back to Los Angeles, my hometown. But instead of running for the state legislature, given the fact that I had a background in city planning, I decided to run for the city council. And although I lost my first race, I came back four years later, defeated the incumbent who had beat me, beaten me four years earlier. Uh, and that, that was the start of, uh, of my career. Um, I think that, uh, Valerie, I, th I think if I have a little more time, I'd like to give some quick tips about what I think students who are interested in public life need to know. Yes, please first, do. First of all, I would say, understand that there is no single mold for a politician. In other words, there's not a single personality type. There's not a s single career. Uh, Decades ago, I think a lot of people thought you had to be a lawyer to, to run for office. And, you know, no disrespect to Professor Zerunian or to Mayor Jensen, but you don't have to be a lawyer. And if anything, I think the percentage of lawyers in the legislatures or the city councils is actually declining for some reason. Um, uh, another point is that elected officials move at different velocities. Um, when I worked for Senator Roberti, who was first elected at age 26 and spent decades in the legislature, I developed a lot of respect for elected officials who are able to continue careers for many years. Um, however, there were other elected officials who were more like shooting stars. In other words, they sort of blazed across the sky very quickly and, and, and left. And, you know, without intentionally doing it, I think my own career was somewhat like that. Uh, but it, all I'm saying is there are different trajectories or velocities for careers. Another point I would make is get a mentor. It's really helpful. Uh, I was lucky to have several mentors at different stages of my career. 
So I'd mention that. And last but not least, I would say, if you're seriously thinking about going into politics, be prepared to be knocked down. Uh, that happens, but then you can get up. And uh, the last thing I would say is, having been out of office since the 1990s, that losing an election is not the end of, of life. Uh, in other words, there's, there's life after losing an election. And the things that you learn in politics actually can be applied to continuing to be an idealist and continuing to try to uh, change the world. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And what a great way to round out our self-introductions with some very solid tips on resilience and finding a mentor and your career continuing, etc. So thank you. Uh, Terrence is going to run a little poll right now um, so we can give our professionals a sense of where are you at in your career exploration? Are you an undergraduate? Do you have eight years of World of Work experience? So uh, please fill out the demographic information and then I'll report. And while we're waiting to get the results of our little poll, um, just one more quick question. And I'm going to start with Marsha because she already leaned into this a little bit. You know, you all come from different uh, professional backgrounds with a shared commitment of community, loving and serving your community and becoming a public servant. So there's a whole wide set of skills I think that you probably need to have. And Marsha, you talked a little bit about analyzing issues. Um, what are a few other skills that you think are tantamount to success in public service? Well, uh, following up a little bit about what Michael uh, said, you will get knocked down. So thick skin yeah. um, and be, I think analysis matters a lot. And I think being able to communicate your ideas in an effective way, not only to the public, but to your colleagues. Because remember, if you're working on a council, you're convincing however many it might be, in my case, four other people, uh, why my position might be the correct one. Or working through policies and realizing that it's going to take time. So a skill set is patience. Uh, and developing that those constituents and those voting blocks that uh, you know support a policy position you might be taking. Um, also, be prepared to explain yourself. If I vote something that a way that's not popular, I'm always prepared to say why I did it, what the reason is, and back it up with whatever policy or ordinance there might be. Uh, preparedness, I think, is really important. Uh, don't wing it. Come in and uh, know what you're doing. Um, and, you know, know your community, get out there and meet people, see what they're interested in. Uh, don't go on next door because you go crazy. Uh, you can, of course, but um, things like that are, are a little hard, but know your community very well. I respect your community. Uh, so, you know, analytics, I, I, especially this year, uh, I would emphasize being proactive. So we have had to go out there and get in front of a lockdown, a fire, uh, economic recovery, a business shutdown, whatever it might be. So anticipation, identification of issues and being proactive and getting that message out. So every week I, I wrote a message out on the town's website to, to the community saying, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing, hang in there, blah, blah, blah. You gotta be a little bit of a cheerleader. Um, so those skills, those reading, writing and communication skills I think are the most important. But thanks, Valerie. Excellent. A uh, great set of skills. Makes complete sense. Uh, Shirley, what do you have to add? Uh, well, I double down on the, the previous comments that have been made. And uh, when I was thinking about this question, I really came up with four thoughts that maybe these apply uh, as much in business as they do in public life. But, you know, the first one is be a really good listener. Be the person that listens and understands what people, you know, whether it's stakeholders or fellow council members, be curious about what other people are saying. The second one is to encourage teamwork and collaboration, you know, encourage bringing people together, finding common ground, just that encouragement is such a positive force. Um, the third one is to be action oriented. Um, look for what's the next action that we can take. In other words, if it looks like people are not all agreeing, you know, what is the one thing that we could agree on scheduling a public hearing or, you know, whatever that next step might be. And then the last one is, is kind of a funny one. It's never say no right away. Um, 
I agree completely with Marsha that, you know, sometimes the right vote to make is a no vote. And, and sometimes that's the right answer, but be sure that you really understand the situation and the perspective of the stakeholders before you, before you say no. So the, the clever thing about those four is they spell lean, which you had said, uh, you know, leaning in, Marsha was leaning in and I was like, great setup. So listen, encourage teamwork, action orientation, and, and never say no right away. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have uh, Frank and Michael to comment, and both of you have taught students, so you're seeing the skills they're developing in academic sense as well. Frank, what do you have to add to this conversation on uh, skill acquisition? First off, I agree with everything I heard, so I'm not going to repeat, but a common theme perhaps uh, is emerging as far as the importance of resilience. Uh, I always quote to my students, Nelson Mandela, who said, the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So that's a big deal in public service. Um, so you can't take these things personally. You have to be able to be resilient and absolutely get up every time you're knocked down. So that's critical. Um, the things I can add, and I tell my students all the time, and, and sometimes our colleagues get into trouble as a result of these two things that I'm gonna mention. One, humility. The other one, authenticity. Uh, the typical public official that gets into trouble is because he or she has forgotten about those two things. You know, we, uh, we are, uh, always worried about our image and always worried about saying almost yes to everything that we hear because politically it may be a good thing or expedient thing to do, but that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, I always advise be authentic and take the consequence. The shorter route to the truth and ethics is whatever the consequence is. Um, the more you lie, the more you create a lie around you, you find yourself recreating that lie or reliving that lie, which only creates more problems for public officials. So those two things are very, very important. Then the third thing I would focus on is, as an advice to, to those who come after us in public service in particular, is never forget who elected you. Uh, the, it's not the party that elected you. It's not the federal government that elected you. It's your city that elected you. And your constituents are in that city. Never forget your constituents. It's always at their service that we, you need to be. And you need to represent them all. It doesn't work with uh, special interest only. Just because five people are in front of you in council chambers doesn't mean that the decision has to go their way. Uh, it just means that you have to be thoughtful about your entire community and always voting for what is right for your community. And uh, from an academic standpoint, um, I always emphasize in my classes, as, as uh, 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 Marsha knows, to me, communication, both writing and presenting, are critical. Got it. Absolutely critical. How you write uh, professionally, how you present yourself orally um, uh, it, it are absolutely critical. Frank, I'm so uh, uh, inspired to hear you talk about authenticity because I feel that half the work I do is helping people present themselves authentically as candidates to employers and uh, having that core emotional self-efficacy and Emotional intelligence is is a journey I think that students are on. Uh, so I, that resonates with me. So uh, Terence, if you have the results of the poll, let's let's get that. Uh, so today we have thirty percent undergraduates, ten percent of professionals with less than two years of experience, twenty five of masters with two to five, and thirty five with five plus. So pretty well spread with. Uh, uh, more people with two to five plus years experience, in the, but still 40% with 
less experience. So just good for you to know. Um, the questions are piling in. So Mike, if you if there's anything else you want to quickly add, I, I'd love to start to get to the Q&A as well. Sure. I, I just want to make three quick points. Please. Uh, one is um, having people skills, that is being able to re relate to people is very important. Number two, uh, I think uh, communication skills uh, are very important. And number three, it, it helps if you can inherit great wealth. Uh, uh, I mean that ironically, but just a little word about both. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is no single mold, no single stereotype for a politician. So you actually you would be surprised to see how many people in politics actually don't have good people skills mm -hmm. and give boring speeches. Uh, uh, and and um, I make the last point just to say, out of my own experience, having lost the 1993 mayor's race in Los Angeles to a self-financing candidate, that, that an underlying problem and barrier for people going into politics is raising money. And we have to deal with where is the money coming from. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you all. This is just a rich set of responses, um, and I'll guide the next 25 minutes of our discussion. So we're going to move to the questions. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, I was curious how each panelist defines leadership and public service, and what made you decide to pursue a career as an elected official? So we definitely heard a little bit about uh, being raised to be a public servant, but I if you could talk about this definition of leadership and public service, I think that would be really powerful. Uh, Mike, why don't you uh, kick us off? How do you define leadership? Um, well, service? that's a very profound question that may be yeah. beyond me, but let me just try to begin to say that I can think of at least two kinds of leadership, uh, one of which means uh, being like a scout or somebody who's out in front trying to bring along followers or looking for followers to go in a certain direction. Uh, there, and then there's, a, I think, a different kind of leadership, which does not go out in front, does not stick his or her neck out, and basically consolidates or implements. That's one way to answer it. Another way is I would refer Nana to uh, the myth of the, uh, the hedgehog and the fox. Look that one up uh, about different leadership styles. Uh, um, uh, Sir Isaiah Berlin wrote a brilliant essay about how some leaders are more like hedgehogs and some are more like foxes. Some go in a straight line. Others tend to zigzag a lot. Some see the one big thing. Some uh, see many small things. So I think, again, getting back to what I said earlier, there are different kinds of leaders and you don't have to fit, you don't have to fit one type only. Great. Marsha, you're a new graduate 2020. Congratulations. Thank um, you. Um, how are you informed by this notion of what defines leadership these days? Um, you know, it's a question that I should give a lot more thought to, but I really don't. <laughs> um, but I will. Uh, it's a great question. Just actually during being mayor uh, in this environment and being hit in March, i became mayor in November, it hit, it hit in March with the lockdowns and the pandemic, and then in June with protests, and then in September and August with fires, it's sort of been, well, what, what am I doing to lead this down? And I've gotten, you know, I got some emails speaking of thick skin, where's the leadership? And I thought, okay, where is the leadership? What am I going to do? Uh, and I think I'm more of the person that gets in front, and I've chosen this time to lead by example. So, for example, if I want landlords to give renters a break during this time because they don't have money. We took action to forgive rents for our town properties, for example. If I want people to support others in the community, what could we as a town do? We did grants to nonprofit um, organizations. So we tried to get in front of these issues and then tried to show by what we were doing, what we would hope that others would do. And then try to be really empathetic uh, to what is going on, but and but still guide in your empathy. So guide the town toward, we would really like to see this behavior. This is what we're doing. And just be very knowledgeable about what you're doing, what the town is doing, what the, so that you can answer and be responsive to people. So I try to both guide, if you will, not so much lead, mm -hmm. uh, and be responsive. How did I get here? I was unhappy with what was going on in the town. And I thought I wanted to make a, a change. 
And so I put myself in a position to try to make that change. So that's why I ended up running. Thank you. Uh, Frank, I'm gonna give you a two part question because there's a question from a student, Jennifer, that's specifically for you. So we're interested in your interpretation or, or definition of leadership, but her question for you particularly is, how did it feel to go from appointed position to an elected position? May I chime in on that? Oh, please. Yeah, so I mean, that's for all, all of you. I mean, I submitted the question once Frank had talked, but all of you have spoken to this. And I sit on the Planning and Zoning Commission here where I live. And um, it's very rewarding, but there are times when city council trumps our decisions. And it's frustrating to feel like we don't have the policy implementation. But I mean, me just being my personality type, like the, um, you know, um, the scariness of running for a public position and it being, you know, like being in high school, like who's the most popular? Um, I just wonder how you all have dealt with that. First off, uh, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, that's wonderful that you serve uh, in your planning commission. Uh, the planning commission, of course, is, uh, is not a policy body. Uh, and it is possible that, of course, uh, the city council overrides a decision that you make from a policy position. That being said, um, I know from my experience that we have been extremely careful in my city um, to make sure that we give the greatest deference to our um, planning commission in their decisions. Um, in all of my 17 years, uh, I may be able to count on one hand the times that we overturned our planning commission's decision on a decision that was made straight on um, a land use um, implementation issue. Um, so my recommendation to councils is A, select carefully who you put on your planning commission. Uh, so that's an important uh, aspect of the whole thing. Uh, you don't want policymakers on your planning commission or people who feel like they have to make policy on your planning commission. Um, you want people to literally apply the law uh, to land use. And if that happens, if everybody does their job, uh, hardly you would find uh, the scenario that you're describing. As, and as I said, in my city, I can count in one hand probably in all of my years where we had to overturn the planning commission. Uh, so I hope that answers that part of the, uh, the question. And as far as the transition is concerned, um, actually from planning commission to the council, it's a very easy transition because once to get to know the land use of your city, that in and of itself teaches you also the culture of your city. Mm -hmm. You know, you would know, for example, neighborhoods, you would know how various neighborhoods react to second floor additions or garage, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, remodels or whatever it may be. I mean, it's, these are very common things, little things, but it makes a huge difference, obviously, if you have a pretty good recognition of what your city looks like and, and your neighborhoods look like. Not one neighborhood is the same as the other. And the planning commission, I think, gives you a great perspective to get to know your city and gives you a huge advantage in running for office ultimately. And, and Marsha did the same thing, for example, and I think Sharon said the same thing. Um, and I recommend to everyone who wants to run for office, go get appointed to your city, uh, you know, to your planning commission, uh, because that really gives you an edge up. And, and uh, um, we're looking to you now, maybe uh, you'll be running for your office uh, next. <laughs> Valerie, can I, can I give a quick response just on the transition? Yeah. Um, so I would say what I used to say to people is that as a planning commissioner, you have the luxury of following the rules. So there are a set of rules and you make a decision for that. And that's a luxury. When you go to the council, when I first got on the council, there was another person on the council who, in my mind, just made things up. And so as a lawyer and a planning commissioner, I, I was floored. I like, how can you say that? And then I recognize, well, politics is different. You can make things up. Um, sometimes they're policy, sometimes there's something else. 
But it, so to me, I found it a little bit jarring because I like, I'm a lawyer. I follow the rules. It's like, that's, is this, and this is what I'm going to do. So as a politician, it's quite different and takes some getting used to. Thank you. Uh, Mike, do you have anything pressing you want to talk about the definition of leadership or shall we move on to the well, question? I was just going to address to Jennifer uh, my own experience. I found it being very frustrating to be a city planning commissioner. I sort of went the other way compared to the other panelists. I was on the city council. Then I served on the planning commission for six years. The, a planning commission in California typically is considered to be a so-called quasi-judicial body. And yeah. as others have said, it's the elected officials who are supposed to be the decision makers. But in reality, I found it very difficult, uh, partly because I found the role of being a planning commissioner to be very limited in terms of what we could do. Um, and frankly, another frustration is frequently ele the elected officials didn't know what they were doing. And then in Los Angeles, it's compounded by uh, uh, the, the way things work compared to other cities, where with 15 council members, each council member basically controlled land use, discretionary decisions over land use in his or her district. And the other council members tended to blindly follow what the council member of the district wanted. So this has led to, uh, frankly, a corruption scandal, which the city council is trying to deal with, which partially has to do with where is the money coming from, who makes the, the decisions about planning, and how does anybody figure out what is the right thing to do. So uh, in some ways, as a planning commissioner, you should envy the fact that your role is limited. On the other hand, um, I think if you really want to do planning, you may need to be somewhere else maybe on a city council. So what's the best way to grow your skill set for campaign fundraising? <laughs> and uh, attached, how feasible is it to run for office as an independent as opposed to a member of the Republican or Democratic parties? Okay, I'm going to answer, try to be very, very quick. Uh, campaign fundraising, get over your complete distaste for asking people for money. Which is was the biggest hurdle for me. I said, I don't want to ask anyone for money, so you need to get over it and recognize, you know, that you believe in what you're doing and you want them to believe in you as well. So, in my town, our council is not is independent. We are we are not party uh, oriented. We're we're not Democrats, Republicans. We're just running as independent people. So I don't have that issue. Uh, someone else want to talk about building the skill set for finance um, fundraising or running as an independent? Um, I'd be happy to talk about that, uh, Valerie. I think the best way to gain skills in fundraising, there's, there's number one, do it, which you can do it through nonprofits you might be affiliated with or other organizations. Also working on someone else's campaign and get to know people in that campaign one of the best things you can do, depending on the size of the campaign you might be putting together, would be to find good volunteers and good help by working on another campaign. You might find people who you could then recruit to work for you in your campaign at the point you do it. So it's important to kind of plan ahead on that skill building. Um, and I forgot the second question. Just running as an independent, is it? Oh, right. Yeah. So we're we're uh, independent um, in our city as well. So it's not it's not party affiliated. Okay. Um, uh, Elena Chavez, I, I understand you have a complex question. Do, do you like to go on camera and introduce yourself? And then if we have time, we'll end with how do you actually build mentors? So Elena. Hi, um, I'm currently working for the Joe Biden Kamala Harris ticket for the state of Arizona. Um, and it's actually my first time working for a campaign and I, I really, really enjoy it. Um, I just like um, empowering communities, talking to folks. Um, and I thought maybe like running eventually for public service would be maybe in my future. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, what do you all recommend my next steps for this afterwards? Um, what departments like in the campaign now should I connect to? And what jobs or experiences have you found uh, most valuable in your pursuit of public service? And are you all hiring? <laughs> Brave girl, good job. <laughs> 
Um, who wants to tackle that? Kind of was multi-part question. What departments should she connect in in the current campaign? What next, how you build your resume? What's your next step? Okay. Uh, let me just give my example. Um, um, when I was a freshman in college, I decided to volunteer for my first political campaign. I, I, I worked for uh, uh, Congressman George Brown, who ran as the anti-war candidate uh, for the U.S. Senate in California. And uh, he lost the election. But um, I, as a college freshman, I was the chairman of his Santa Cruz County campaign in 1970. And I had a great time. I learned lots of things. If, I probably sounded somewhat like you in terms of being excited about, about what I was learning and what I was doing. But then the election was over and I didn't know what to do next, except I thought this is worth learning about. So mm -hmm. uh, in my case, I thought, well, if Congressman Brown was a good congressman, surely the person running to succeed him must be good as well. So I called up the office, the campaign office of the state senator who was running for the House of Representatives. And the woman who answered the phone said, no, we don't need any volunteers here. Why don't you go volunteer at Assemblyman Roberti's office. They always need help there. And I did. And that that eventually led six years later to uh, being offered a paying job in his Sacramento staff. So in other words, all I'm saying is one thing leads to another. And uh, look for mentors, look for people who can point you in the right direction. And after this campaign is over, no matter how it turns out, look look at who you've met or what you've gotten interested in, and that will lead you towards what you should do next. That's great. Uh, Marsha or Shirley, anything quick to add to that building? No? Okay. All right. Um, so mentorship, that's a perfect segue. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, it's a process to build a, an actual mentor-mentee relationship. So when you propose to students to find a mentor, can you give some concrete examples about how to start to uh, forge those relationships and actually uh, find someone who's willing to mentor you and guide you? Should I start? Sure. Um, uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, I have always had lots of mentors. Uh, in, in, in graduate school at Berkeley, uh, I was assigned to a man named Leonard Duell to be my advisor, who was a surprising choice. He was a psychiatrist. What was the psychiatrist doing teaching in urban planning? It was because he had worked in the Johnson administration on the war in poverty. And then he, I was assigned to him at Berkeley, and we had this great relationship, and he taught me lots of things, ultimately led me to my first job. I would say my advice for anybody who's looking for a mentor is just be open to it. Keep your eyes open as to somebody who's been doing something that relates to what you're interested in or somebody who's done something that you wish you could do too and talk to them. Even now, many years later, uh, there are a couple, actually two or three young people who I basically meet for breakfast or meet for dim sum or, you know, talk to occasionally, we stay in contact and, uh, and, and, and that's how that works. So, so uh, I would say, look for them, or they may come looking for you, but basically be open to having a mentor. Thank you. And Marsha, I know you have to sign off. I, I'm going to, I'm going to jump off. So I'll answer this quickly. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that Michael said. And one of the uh, good things about looking for jobs in public service or with elected officials is they have to respond to you. We have to respond. Uh, so reach out. Uh, I get uh, requests a lot. Will you, you know, talk to me about whatever it is? And I'm happy to do that. I did that myself with a, a person who I knew as the lawyer then who actually joined the council in my town and was on the planning commission. And I would stay in touch and get her advice and just meet with her with for coffee, you know, whatever that might be. But, and then, you know, in turn, as you mentor someone else, you will build a network, but reach out because we will, we will get back to you. The public servants will do that. Marcia, it's been such a delight to hear your story today. Uh, best of luck with everything. Thank That's you. I'm going to, I'm going to stop fires in Los Gatos. So, so thank you very much. Um, I appreciate being on this panel. Great to see everyone and good luck in your career. She's generously agreed to share her contact information. So thank you so much, Marcia. Bye-bye. Uh, Frank, what are your thoughts on sourcing? So, uh, first, first off, uh, I am going to uh, um, echo what Michael said. 
I too was extremely lucky to have had amazing mentors. Um, in law school, I remember uh, at the time, I was uh, first introduced through a friend of my father's uh, to people that I'm going to name now that Michael is going to know very well, uh, to Wally Karabian. Um, Wally then, who was in the, uh, in the assembly, um, uh, served in the assembly many years, had a major network. So through Wally, I used to go to these lunches at Chasen's, who later I realized who I was meeting. Um, and I realized that as a young second year law student was listening, to the speaker of the house in California, um, uh, Mr. Brown. So uh, he was there on a regular basis. Uh, um, Mike Cruz, um, who was there on a regular basis. These people became my friends and, and my mentors. And I'm certainly Governor, of course, Dick Majin, who was a great friend and a great mentor and justices on the Supreme Court of California, Arabian and Baxter, uh, just, uh, Judge Tabrizian on the federal bench who swore me into the bar. So all these people have a great influence in my life. Uh, there's no question about it. I mean, it's just how it works. Just like Mike, those people's imprints are on us. So to, to, to Elena, who asked that question, I say, be a sponge right now. Um, your job is to learn as much as possible and to interact as many people as possible. One thing I advise you to do uh, at your level, do not be a partisan. Uh, while it's good for you to work on a particular campaign, be open and tolerate all views and allow your network to grow. It's not about only one side of the equation. Um, and it's very important for you to remain a sponge and you'd be surprised. And Mike named a bunch of people. I named a bunch of people. They come from different sides of walks of life uh, as far as uh, uh, political views, as well as personalities, et cetera. So your job, it, don't be, be caught in one camp uh, because you have a lot to go. And, you, and, and if you're caught in one camp, uh, it may not work ultimately. So mm -hmm. I say this to all of our students, and one of the things that I find lacking, unfortunately, because of this, this unfortunate conversation that takes place um, in our media and, and at the, the higher federal level of this polarization, I think is making us less tolerant. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is anything that I would advise any one of you is... Uh, is tolerance. No matter what the views are, there is no one way of slicing a bread. There's many ways. So I just want you to be open. I just want you to be a sponge as I was. I was not even in a position to judge when I was in my second year in law school, necessarily wrong or, or right for that matter. So be a sponge, learn as much as you can, build your network, go across lines and, and tolerate views and, and talk to anybody and everybody because you never know where you're gonna land. The more you close your mind and the more you buy into a particular rhetoric, uh, the less of a network you're gonna have. Thank you, Frank. That's, those are wonderful tips and so invaluable right now. Uh, Shirley, you wanna bring us home? Uh, maybe a different perspective working in the private sector or female mentorship, what would you like to add? Well, two things come to mind. One is just following up on the professor's comment. It's build bridges, don't burn them. You know, build, look at yourself and say, am I building bridges or am I burning bridges? And, and as long as you keep building, your network will grow. Uh, the thing about mentorship, I was, I've been thinking about that question since it was asked, and I think to me the best strategy and has worked well in my career is to find someone who I'm interested in being my mentor and then um, you know, reach out to them and just offer something that they might be interested in, offer to meet. And generally speaking, um, I've had good success with people 
you know, when you express an interest in them and you say, hey, this is, you know, a direction I want to add to my career. Can you help me with that? You know, generally the response has been, sure, you know, how can I help you? So mm-hmm. I think the key is don't, you know, don't, if, if you're afraid, it, it almost sounded like the person might be, you know, how do I, how do I help encourage mentorship? And I think sometimes there's a fear factor involved and just sort of throw that away and say, I want to meet, I want to meet this person, or I want to, I want to have a good engaged conversation with this person and just go do it. And I think the, the richness of the Trojan network bears out. There's just an incredibly committed, passionate group of alumni that are absolutely committed to giving back. And I think young professionals don't feel there's real reciprocity early in their careers. They, they have more to gain than they have to give. Um, so I know in my conversations, sometimes students like, well, I don't have a lot to offer. So these comments are very, very helpful. Uh, Mike, I don't remember if you got to touch on mentorship. Did you start us off or? I think I did. You did. Okay. Well, it's 501 and I think this is a, an organic place and to fulfill on my commitment to end close on time. Um, Shirley, Mike, Frank, and of course, Marsha, who had to jump off. This was a, a very exciting, informative discussion. I'm confident that our students learned a great deal. I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to ask the panelists just to stay on for two minutes, uh, but this ends our session. Uh, thanks again to Frank for introducing us and acknowledging Marlin's hard work in putting this together and the Urban Planning Department Spatial Analysis. And thank you, Terrence, for running the show. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, hope to see you at the panel starting up next spring. Valerie, if I might, uh, just for a second. Um, The the only thing I wanted to say is I wanted to add to it is that for all of our students, one of the things that I don't see enough of is students knocking on my door to ask something. Gotcha. So you are in an amazing university, one of the best in the world, and you are not using your resources as you should be using. I hear you. So I would hardly suggest to you, because I have not met one of my uh, colleagues that would actually shut the door on you and say, go away. Right. Um, Please tap the resources that are right in front of you and come and ask. Now, if I'm busy right that moment, I may say, come back in half an hour or tomorrow. But regardless, I'd be delighted to talk to you as the case with all of my colleagues, I'm sure. So please take us up on this and uh, uh, use the resources that you have at school and, and, and really, really excel in all of this. Valerie, I want to thank you again um, and your staff for doing an amazing job in, in helping our students uh, in the uh, professional world. And that's very important to us as a professional school. Michael, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, it's, it's so rich to hear from you, your experience uh, in the city of LA as one of the largest cities, uh, not only in California, but obviously in the United States and the world. So your experience matters a lot. Uh, And certainly, Shirley, thank you for your participation as well. Um, And if you're still in the program, you may end up in my class. I don't know. We'll we'll see, but uh, regardless. First semester uh, after this, so I don't know where you fall, but uh, yeah. All right, well, I I, uh, wanted to uh, thank you both. uh, And of course, Marsha, who left us, Uh, for joining us. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, Good evening, everyone.